You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Excited to get started today. Ivan, please go ahead and introduce today's guest. Hi, I'm Ivan Zach. Uh, Really excited to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Michael Petty. Dr. Petty is a DVM. He is an author of Dr. Petty's Pain Relief for Dogs, The Complete Medical and Alternative Guide to Treating Pain. He's a veterinarian and certified veterinary pain management expert and acupuncturist. As the owner of the Arbor Point Veterinary Hospital and the Animal Pain Center in Canton, Michigan, he has devoted his professional life to the care of well-being of animals. Dr. Petty is the past president of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management and co-author of the AHA and AFB 2015 Pain Guidelines. A frequent speaker and consultant, he has published articles in veterinary journals and served in advisory capacity to several pharmaceutical companies on topics for pain management. Dr. Petty lives in rural Michigan on a horse farm with his wife and two daughters and two Portuguese water dogs. Welcome to the show, Dr. Petty. Thanks for having me on. So we're going to talk today about Gecko Vet. Can you briefly explain to listeners what is Gecko Vet? There probably is no brief explanation, but I'll try to cap <laughs> it. So, you know, let me start by saying for a long time on our human counterparts, what I like to call our, our single species doctors counterparts, they have a variety of software programs that help them make diagnoses and recommend treatments, recommend lab work, things like that. Nothing like that has happened in the veterinary world until now. And GeckoVet is a platform wherein you can register a patient, put in signs that you see, you know, physical exam signs. Uh, You can put in lab work results, radiographic findings, and then press a button and it gives you a list of rule outs in descending order of probability. So, you know, you've got the very top one and it assigns a number to it. And then, um, you know, sometimes you get like a hundred different possibilities because that's the reality of of veterinary medicine, right? When we look at an animal, you know, almost anything's possible, but, you know, we can look at the numbers that are produced and some of them have high number counts and they quickly drop down to very low number counts. So, you know, it doesn't mean it can't be that, but it means that we need to, you know, consider the high ones first. So moving forward from there, what it does is you then can click on any one of these things and it will suggest inclusion and exclusion tests and exams and radiographs and things like that. And when you narrow down to what you think is the diagnosis, you can choose it and then it will go ahead and give you some suggested treatments. Um, It usually lists, depending on the disease, it may have one or two treatment protocols. It may have a dozen treatment protocols. And these are all based, everything is based on either published veterinary textbooks. About 80% of them are published either in the United States or in the UK or on some peer-reviewed articles. Nothing is left to anecdotal stories about this is how you treat this and that. And it uses references like plums and so forth. So it's like having this vast library at your fingertips. Super cool. So there's a couple of things that I want to kind of unpack there. I love the comment about the single species human counterparts. A uh, little plug there for them. Um, the most interesting thing that you said is that nothing's existed like this yet in the veterinary domain. The only time that I've ever seen anything that even is remotely like this is a bit of predictive um, text and predictive kind of like opportunities to explore more in VetSpire. And, and I don't know how much they've built out those capabilities, but that's the only time I've even seen anything similar. Why has it taken so long for something like this to happen in veterinary medicine? It's a vast, vast undertaking. And, you know, they have put years into doing this. Uh, The investment is in, you know, a couple of million euros that they have done this. This was based in Finland. By the way, as an aside, I've lectured around the world. I've lectured extensively in the United States. And only when I was, have I ever popped a sweat lecturing was to finish veterinarians. I think they are probably the the, the best educated of any veterinarians in the world, bar none. 
So I'm not surprised that something like this came out of Finland. So the, the CEO of the company, uh, Johanna, I've known her for a long time. She used to work for Orion Pharmaceuticals. They produce, you know, common drugs like Dexdomotor and Saleo and, and things like that. And she just has a real passion that goes beyond capitalism, can I say. And she really, really wanted to make the world a better place for veterinary medicine. It's the same um, software as I'm listening to this, as you know, right now, the radiographic AI driven interpretation is sort of augmenting the role of the radiologist and and it has sort of controversial, you know, feedback. Some people are saying, I don't trust this. This is a computer. Some people love it. And um, it reminds me of the smart flow days when when we build in the calculator for uh, for the drugs and you just put in, you know, the weight of the patient and then the milligrams and it gives you the total volume to be given. And I remember an argument with one veterinarian who said, I don't trust this. I like to calculate my own doses. My one, my doctors to calculate own doses. And I said, well, how do you do this? And then she's, well, you're taking the weight, you're taking the dosage and then you multiply, divide by the concentration. And I'm like, and what do you use for that? A calculator. I'm like, that's what it is. <laughs> so that was, right. and it was interesting that kind of connecting the dots for that person. But but it's uh, there is some resistance I know to the digital radiology, uh, and I call it augmented radiology because it doesn't give you all the answers, but it, it gives you at least the direction or point out you know the obvious. Sometimes is there a pushback from veterinary field to this, saying that either a we don't need it or b the robots are replacing us and we're gonna go extinct. So I actually um, started using a program to help interpret radiographs um, about a year ago. And, you know, one of the things I've learned and one of the disclaimers they have at the end of it is, you know, you're the veterinarian, you have to make the diagnosis. And I think this is really true. This cannot possibly replace a veterinarian because, you know, just like the old term when computers came out, garbage in, garbage out, you really need to know what you're talking about. You really need to know what findings are important, which ones are outliers, and to go ahead and, you know, be intelligent about it and to interpret the results. And if something is like pecking away at the back of your head that it's not right, then you know you need to listen to it. This is a tool. It's not your replacement. Yeah, it's so interesting. So uh, which radiographic um, AI program are you using? Can't help but ask. Signal. Okay, cool. It was one of two because we've had them both on the show. So good plug for those guys. Yeah. So uh, let's dig in a little bit more into this kind of resistance and what you guys have seen at Gecko Vet. You know, it, it's it's a really interesting time for technology because veterinary medicine has never been like this. It's never been so many pets, so few veterinarians, so few options to kind of like get through the day a little bit quicker. And Gecko Vet seems like an option to maybe speed up some of the you know, especially if you're a, a single vet in the middle of nowhere, it's like what a, what a beautiful tool to be able to have all of this information at your hands. So what's the adoption rate been like in, in the U.S. and what's the experience been like for you guys kind of growing and trying to help veterinarians kind of get a little bit more time back in their day? Right. So, you know, we haven't had a formal launch in the U.S. We've had kind of a soft launch where we've been at, you know, a couple of small conferences and talk to some people and ask them to try it out. Anyone who's interested in it can go ahead and, you know, sign up for it for free for 30 days and, and try it out. And I, I guess in order to explain the resistance, I probably have to explain the acceptance first. When I talk to veterinarians that have been practicing 15 plus years, there's a lot of pushback on this. When I go to uh, a veterinary school and like I went to Michigan State University and lectured to their business club, I was five minutes into the lecture and the young students are like, how do I sign up for this? So I think, you know, it is one of the things that we have that's an issue. And, you know, I remember when I graduated, it was really hard when you saw an animal because everything was a possibility when this animal came in sick. It might have, you know, two or three abnormal lab works and a half a dozen physical exam findings. And I had a hundred things. Everything was a possibility. 
because as we practice, we start to develop this thing called pattern recognition. And if you don't know what pattern recognition is, this is something that's actually hardwired into our brains so that everything isn't a threat. Everything isn't something that needs attention. You know, think of our primitive selves standing at the edge of a jungle and there's a rustling in the jungle. We learn to recognize a squirrel versus a tiger sound, right? So our brain pushes away the squirrel and pays attention to the tiger sound. Pattern recognition then goes forward to veterinary medicine where I will see a history. I will see what my technician wrote down. I haven't walked into the exam room and looked at the animal yet, but I have a diagnosis in my head and I am right about 75% of the time before I've even walked in the room. The problem is, is that our brains then try to make the facts fit our preconceived notions. So I'm kind of jumping back and forth between new and old, but you know, the young students don't have this pattern recognition. Every case they are presented with is overwhelming. And to have a tool like Gecko not only speeds up their diagnostic process, it increases their diagnostic acumen. It decreases the amount of time they have to go to a senior partner or a mentor and ask a question. And honestly, it improves the, the life of the animal and the owner at several levels. Think about, you know, we don't want a new student doing a fishing expedition on every single case of diarrhea that comes in and send the owner home with a bill of $800 because that owner isn't going to come back or they're going to find something significant and they're not going to have the money to do the treatment. And then think about the, the animal itself. We're going to reduce the amount of fear and anxiety in that animal as we do less testing and focus in on things. So this is the benefit to the new student, to the practitioner who's been around for a long time. Really think about the fact that, you know, I go in and I've got this preconceived notion and, you know, darn it, I'm going to make it fit. And we forget about that. And since I started using GeckoVet, not only do I start seeing other diseases, which sometimes they are, the other thing that this really does, and I, I don't think I mentioned this in my synopsis of it, it gives you a list of comorbidities. So, you know, we also kind of drill down on what is going on. This is the diagnosis, but don't forget, a dog or a cat with this diagnosis also often has A, B, and C, and we need to uh, remember those things because we can successfully treat that disease but lose the patient if we don't pay attention to the other things. That's really cool. There's several things that you uh, mentioned there. And and I think that this is probably the way to advance to the market because uh, one thing immediately came to mind when you, when you described what it does, I immediately thought what you said about mentor. Because every student when graduates or new grad and wants to go to work, they want to make sure there's a decent mentor. And then mentor considering how busy we are and how few veterinarians are out there, the last thing that mentors want is someone bugging them every single case because they have their caseload. So so I see a huge need there. And then also, as you said, the, the confirmation bias that we have after a couple of years in practice, you just, you know, it across the room when you look at them or, you, right. you know, just like you said, from technicians come in and they would tell you that I think it's a cruciate. Or I think it's in this, you know, and, and, and I respect the text too. But the uh, the confirmation bias behind it is huge because you kind of convince yourself what it is and now you're going to make it make it sick that way. <laughs> so right. you have something to treat. Uh, so I totally agree with that. That's a very interesting. I never thought about this. And, and if pitched properly, yeah, there's a big need for that. And um, also thank you when you were talking about the product. That's essentially a five-minute consult because that's what people go to. That was my Bible for, I worked in ER for, for all my career. And then when you go and check out the five minute console, that's exactly what it gives you. You look at the symptoms, but it doesn't give you that variety. But the question is that, that I have that you probably also bumped into, and I don't know, again, is it solved or is it an idea that you should, uh, or you could suggest to, to the developers entering everything second time. That's the, the, that I'm thinking about, you know, if I could enter all my, diagnostic parameters and everything else in the history in a way so it is plugged into Gecko. And then as I go about to write up my assessment and just come up with a list of differentials, then it would be 
very useful. But if I have to put it in two places, what is the workflow like? Is it something that vet needs to sit down and separately enter? Or can you ask a technician to do it in advance? So as you're going into it, then you have all this information. What is it? What is the user experience like? So here's the user experience. And one of the things that Gecko did in their beta testing was they actually integrated it with some veterinary software. Oh, that's cool. And the veterinarians hated it. They wanted their comments were things like, I want this to be my own secret weapon. I don't want it to be part of the file, things like that. And so it's it's always a possibility because it's, you know, got this um, coding that allows it to interface with, you know, whether it's IDEX or veterinary software or whatever. It, it could happen, but at least initially veterinarians weren't accepting of that part. But in terms of the workflow, there's two ways to do it. They have this thing called a quick diagnosis. And you put in dog or cat, male and female spayed and neutered, that's it. And then you can start adding the signs that you see. And really we're talking under two minutes. So call it the two minute veterinary consultant. You have got all the information that you want. There is another one that is where you actually enter the dog information and you know the more specifics of this animal breed things like that so you know and the advantage of that one is that it brings up breed specific diseases the disadvantage of it is it's going to take you an extra two minutes to put all the information in but this case will be saved forever and ever and then you can go and update it later on where the quick diagnosis is one that you know the information is is gone as soon as you exit out of that screen so there's a use for both of them you mentioned that you you worked as an er vet i see this quick diagnosis thing as being a godsend for er vets when they have to make a decision here they can put in this information they can generate a list that they can share with the clients and then they can go down the list and say this is the most likely thing this is the least likely thing these are the things that we have to do as rule outs to be able to get down to that and find out what it is because they're not keeping this as a patient, right? They're going to have it maybe that visit or maybe a 24 hours or something like that. So they don't need it. But on the other hand, if it is you're in practice and this is going to be a hard one to work up, then you can go ahead and put in the information and save it and go back and revisit it after you've done the radiographs, after you've done the lab work and and build on it there they're also and, and this is kind of interesting and they haven't talked about doing it in the us yet but it's going to happen they're, they're talking about an app called gecko pet where you can then communicate with the owner and actually get feedback as to whether or not it worked so you know one of the problems that we have in private practice is we send them out the door and you know, it's either, you know, they don't come back. They're either happy because it worked, they're mad because it didn't, they went somewhere else, or they're too broke to follow up, you know, one of the three. And we never know sometimes how we're doing. So it can be really good feedback. And this is a feature I think might scare a few veterinarians to find out what kind of job they're doing. But I think this is um, this is a really good thing. And, and also from a future research point of view, you know, to have this real world data. Yeah, so, so interesting. So a couple things. Um, I really appreciated when you were talking about the younger veterinarians and then you were struggling to find a word for the older veterinarians. And so I have one for you. You can call them a little bit young. That <laughs> happened in the bar the other day. A friend of mine that was sitting with us was 70 and the guy was commenting on how he liked to be around young people conversation. And he looked at my friend that was obviously older than him. And he said, you're a little bit young. And it was, it was pretty, yeah. pretty funny. I'm going to use that. Yeah. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> a little bit young. Yeah. I'm 65. I'm going to use yeah, that. Yeah. A little, you're a little <laughs> bit young. Yeah. It's perfect. So uh, the question that I had is like, what happens with this data? Is it the data of like the selection criteria and the diagnostic? And then especially if we layer in this pet parent app where we're kind of getting feedback, is that data going to go in and make the AI or the modeling the that this app is able to do better and better and better for the veterinarians? So basically everything I've talked about so far has been working on an algorithm. The moment we get feedback into it, AI is going to not take over, but enhance the program by looking at things like geographic areas and, you know, likelihood of diagnoses based on, you know, 
whatever. And it, it is mm-hmm. going to enhance the diagnostic capability. Right now, AI has no real role in it until it starts to get that feedback. It's purely algorithm but AI is built into it. Super cool. Well, listen, we, we've run out of time. We like to wrap up the same way every episode, so we get a couple questions for you. Uh, what's a book, YouTube, TED Talk video, something that you found inspiring as like a, a tech-enabled veterinarian um, in your career so far that you'd recommend to our listeners? One of my favorite books that I've read recently is Anything by Jill Madison, a veterinarian from the UK. And the second question that we ask, is there a guest that you would recommend to be on this podcast? Yes. Mary Gardner is one of the owners of Lap of Love, an in-home euthanasia and hospice care service. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.